So, now we've covered the functions of the skeletal system, just going to move on to the main bones in the body. So, to start off with, I'm going to describe the divisions of the skeleton. The skeleton is divided into two parts. We have the axial skeleton. Axial you think of as the central part, a bit like the axis of a car. And it consists of all the bones in the skull, the vertebral column, the sternum or breastbone, and the ribs. The appendicular skeleton are the bits that are added on. So that would be the arms, the legs, and the bits that attach them to the body. So here we have the clavicle and scapula attaching the arm to the body. Clavicle also known as collarbone and scapula also known as shoulder blade. And here we have the bones on the pelvic girdle which are attaching the legs to the body. So axial as in central part and appendicular as in appendage or added on bit. So here is just I'm just working through the manual and um, everything that I say everything that I cover will be in the manual and if not I'll point that out to you. Okay so starting off with bones on the head and face. So I know there are a lot of bones to remember but what I've done and what helped me a lot when I was studying anatomy is I have used a lot of nonsense poems that's also explained in the little um, study manual as well. Um, Colour, as I pointed out before, is a great way of helping you to remember helping things to stick in your head. So here we have the occipital. It's also generally called the, the uh, skull bone, but for anatomy we're going to call it the occipital bone. Then we have the parietal bone. We actually have two parietal bones, one on each side, and the uh, fontanelle of a baby is found between the parietal bones. We have the frontal bone, which is the forehead. We have the sphenoid little bone here, that is right in front of the temples, and temporal, which is the temples. So two of those bones should be easy enough to remember. Temple, temporal over the temples, frontal over the forehead. And for the rest, we have a nonsense poem, which I have in the manual for you. And that is, often people see far things. So having something like that, at least you'll know what the first letter of each bone is. And that will usually be enough to trigger a memory for you. Okay, and here below that, then, we have the bones on the face. This one here, uh, lower jaw bone, as you can see there, it's tinged. It is hinged even. The lower jaw bone contains the lower teeth. Um, the mandible is the only movable bone in the face. Maxilla, upper jaw bone, contains the upper teeth. Zygomatic is the cheekbone and if you can imagine when you smile muscles around here lift up and you can see your cheekbone is kind of outlined when you smile to my mind for some reason zygomatic sounds happy so you're smiling when you use your cheekbone some of these nonsense things might help you nasal bone as his name suggests is on the nose etmoid bone is a bone that forms the orbital cavity. The lacrimal bone, I have a picture for you further on, the lacrimal bone houses tear ducts. It's a teeny tiny little bone housing tear ducts. And how I think of that, how I would remember that, I think lacrimal. So <clears throat> that little tip is also on the manual for you as well. What's not actually on this diagram um, is the palatine bone. The palatine bone basically forms the palate of the mouth. Another bone that's not included here is the hyoid, which I will cover in the very near future. 
So this is just the nonsense poem as I laid it out there and the bones we've just covered. Here we have the bones on the face and for the bones on the face I also have a little nonsense poem that might help you. Many, many zoos perhaps have very noisy large elephants. So I do find that the poems are easier to go into the head and once you've learned the stuff the poems are a memory trigger because otherwise you have so much knowledge in your head and then the problem is not that you don't know it, the problem is accessing it. So here we have these nonsense poems for that. The hyoid bone is technically a bone in the face. It's actually at the root of the tongue, just there. Um, the hyoid bone, if it's broken, that is a proof that cause of death was either strangulation or hanging because that's the only way the hyoid bone can be broken. And here we have a picture, a bit of a more clearer picture of where the lacrimal bone is. So what I'd suggest before you go on is that you maybe stop and just go back over those bones so bones on the cranium, the cranium is the skull as opposed to the face, it's kind of back of the head. Often people see far things, occipital, parietal, sphenoid, frontal, temporal. Again the frontal you'll probably guess and the temporal you'll probably guess as well. Bones on the face, again a lot of bones here, many many zoos perhaps have very noisy large elephants, mandible, maxilla, zygomatic, palatine, hyoid, vomer, which I may have missed, that actually separates the two nasal passages, nasal, lacrimal and ethmoid. Okay, and then moving on to the bones on the hands and the feet. The hands and feet are actually quite similar in structure. So wrist bones are called carpals and ankle bones are called tarsals. And to remember the difference between carpals and tarsals just think C for clap, T for tap. I do have this for you also on the manual. The long bones running through the hand basically between the wrist and the fingers are called metacarpals. The long bones running on the foot basically between the ankle and the toes are metatarsals. Bones in the toes and bones in the fingers are both called phalanges. So similar in structure. I am going to go through the individual bones on the wrist and the ankle but I find that obviously I can't speak for every um, awarding body as such but Mostly questions tend to be around metacarpals, metatarsals, phalanges, the uh, collective name of the wrists and the ankles. As I say, I can't guarantee that and of course any kind of question can come up so I'm going to cover them. But even if you know the tarsals, the phalanges, metacarpals, metatarsals, usually should be enough. So that's just my little nonsense poem to remember the difference between carpals and tarsals. C for clap, T for tap. And now this is just another diagram of the bones on the hand. So phalanges. We have three bones in each, each finger even and two bones in the thumb. Metacarpals five long bones in the hand, the carpals are wrist bones. 
So I have a nonsense poem again to help you remember that. So some tips like pointing to the ceiling height. I'm going to go through the actual bones here in the diagram. Um, you would rarely be actually asked, um, say, about the individual bones on the carpet, but we go through it anyway. So this one here is the trapezium coming down directly from the little finger. Trapezoid would be the next finger. Capitate is here. And hamate is here. And this little bone here is known as the pisiform bone. It's directly below the little finger and you'll feel on your wrist the outer edge or little finger edge of your wrist there's a little bump and that bump is the pisiform bone. The one up above that is the lunate bone. This one over here is the scaphoid them all covered I think. So some tips like pointing to the ceiling high. The scaphoid, triquetal, pisiform, lunate. Scaphoid, triquetal, pisiform, lunate, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. And now we're going to have a little look at the bones on the feet. So we've just already mentioned the um, phalanges. So as with the fingers, we have two bones in the big toe and three in each of the others. Metatarsals, long bones in the foot and five. Tarsals are ankle bones and how we remember the ankle bones. Toes can never come close. So what we have, this bone here is the tarsal bone. The tarsal bone is the actual ankle bone. What you think of, <clears throat> what most people think of as ankle bones <coughs> excuse me, are the actual ends of the two leg bones, which we'll cover shortly. But the actual talus bone is the bone that connects the leg to the foot. Calcanus bone here is the heel bone. So I think of the heel bone as kind of making a kind of a cushion. I don't know if that helps you at all in that. Some people find it helpful. Up here, we have the navicular bone. It's called navicular because of its shape. It's like, like a boat, a little old-fashioned boat maybe, a little rowing boat. This one here is the cuboid, called cuboid because it's cube-shaped. And then we have cuneiform bones. So the cuneiform bones, one is directly below the big toe. That would be the medial. The medial is the inner edge of the body, or big toe side. Intermediate is in between the medial and the lateral, and the lateral is towards the outside, or heading towards the little toe side is not actually directly below the little toe but it's in that direction. So medial, intermediate and lateral cuneiform bones. Okay and then we have everything there in writing for you and here we're on to bones of the leg. Upper leg bone, you may be familiar with this, it's called the femur. The bone that's over the knee, also called kneecap, is patella. The bone, two bones in the lower leg, tibia and fibula, 
tibia is larger and is kind of on the big toe side, how I would think of it like that, T for tibia. And fibula is a smaller bone towards the outside. And now on to the bones, the hip bones are bones on the pelvic girdle. The pelvic girdle is made up of the hip bones, the pubis symphysis and the sacrum. So, bones on the hip, the ilium, the ischium and the pubis are sit bones. The, sorry, are the um, pelvic bones. The pubis is known as the sit bone. They are in a child and a baby, actually separate bones, and they fuse as we get older. So you may have heard a term, a child's got more bones than an adult's got, which is true. So in adults, these bones are fused. This is the sacrum. It's actually the lower part of the vertebrae, which attaches to the pelvic bones. And at the front, so sacrum's at the back. At the front, we have a little wad of cartilage, which is known as the pubis symphysis, sometimes called symphysis pubis, kind of all the same. It's basically a little wad of cartilage that's holding the circle together. So ischium, sorry, ilium, ischium, pubis. Pubis is a sit bone and they're fused. The sacrum is one of the lower parts of the vertebrae. Pubis symphysis is a wad of cartilage that holds the circle together. So arm bones. Um, you will know where your collarbone is. You'll know where your shoulder blade is. So collarbone at the front of the body, shoulder blade at the back. Technical term for collarbone is clavicle. Technical term for shoulder blade is scapula. So to remember them, S for scapula, S for shoulder blade, C for collarbone, and C for clavicle. Then we have the bones on the arm, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. And then the hand again. The humerus bone, um, what might help you to remember the name, if you don't know it already, it is a bone that could be familiar to a lot of people. But the reason why, when you bang your elbow, they refer to it as your funny bone, and it's not funny, it's an absolutely horrible, jarring sensation that goes right through your body. It's called the funny bone because the Latin term for this bone is the humerus. So it's not kind of funny as in funny, but just coming from the Latin name. Latin name. Okay, humerus, radius and ulna. Moving on to the vertebrae, the vertebrae also known as the backbone, sometimes referred to as the spine, it's not actually the spine, the spine is contained inside it, and the vertebrae protect the spine. So there we have all the different types of vertebrae, which we'll go through now. So, it's coloured just according to the different types. We have the cervical vertebrae and these are in the neck. As you can see they're a little bit smaller than the others. That will allow for more flexibility of the neck. The top two cervical vertebrae are called the atlas and the axis and it's between these two vertebrae that the movements for nodding and rotation take place but I'll cover that more on a later lesson. Then we have the thoracic vertebrae. The thoracic vertebrae actually go from the very base of your neck or very top of your back right down to the back of the ribs. So if you slide your hand down your neck and at the end you'll find quite a large bump and that bump is the first thoracic vertebrae. 
Then we have the lumbar vertebrae. Lumbar vertebrae are in the lower back. We have the sacrum, our sacral vertebrae, which we just looked at in the uh, pelvic bones, uh, just below the lumbar and above the coccyx. And this bone will form the back of the pelvic girdle. And then we have the four coccygeal bones. You might look at the lumbar vertebrae. And there's five of those. And look at the sacral vertebrae, also five of those, and say, really, they don't look like the same size. They're nowhere near the same size. The sacral vertebrae are fused, and they're smaller. The lumbar vertebrae are much larger, actually the largest of all the vertebrae you can see there. And that is because they are actually supporting the weight of the thoracic and the cervical above them. Coccygeal vertebrae doesn't look like four vertebrae. They are very, very small. These vertebrae are also known as your tailbone and they they can break um get broken kind of fairly frequently. Childhood accidents is not not difficult to break them, very sore. So looking through the names of the vertebrae, cervical at the neck. Now that can be confusing, confusing when you think of a cervix. But cervical, the word as far as I'm aware, means opening, so it's opening into the brain. Um, thoracic, very large. I, in my head, I have Jurassic. If you heard of Jurassic Park, very very large, as in a lot of them. Lumbar is in the lower back, L for lumbar, L for lower, lumbago is in the lower back, that might also help you. Um, sacral, you will probably remember your sacrum, as in part of your pelvis, and coccyx, you may be aware of that, and if not, um, the coccyx is your tailbone. Um, so how to remember the vertebrae and the order that they go in. So I have an answers poem here for you, but what I find actually maybe a little bit easier than that is just to think of the, the numbers of the vertebrae as almost like a phone number. So seven twelve five five four. You have to say it fast, I don't remember it. So seven twelve five five four, and then just work through the names. So cervical opening onto the brain, thoracic, Jurassic, lumbar, lower, sacrum at the pelvis at the pelvic girdle, coccyx tailbone. I'm going to go through another method as well that may help you. So Carl's terrifically lumpy spine clue. There are seven letters in Carol's and seven cervical vertebrae. Carol's begins with a C, cervical begins with a C. Terrifically, twelve letters in terrifically, twelve thoracic vertebrae. Terrifically begins with T and so does the thoracic. Five letters in lumpy, five letters in lumbar, Sorry, five letters in lumpy and five vertebrae in lumbar. Five letters in spine, five vertebrae in the sacrum. S for sacrum, S for spine. Four vertebrae among the coccyx, four words in clue, C for clue and C for coccyx. Just something that might interest you, um, these curves, this one here at the cervical onto the lumbar and this one are onto the thoracic and the curve in the lower back were not born with. A baby is actually born with a perfectly straight spine. 
when the baby starts to hold his head upright or her head upright, this is when the curve here, the outward curve here, comes between the cervical and the thoracic. And when a baby starts to walk, that is when the lumbar curve or inward curvature on the spine forms. And this just gives you that little bit of interesting fact. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. Um, don't forget to pause as much as you want. I would suggest that you pause, listen to each section a few times, then go on to the next section. So I do have this covered for you on the study guide as well. So, ribs and sternum. We have 12 pairs of ribs. You can ignore these numbers, they're actually from something else. Uh, 12 pairs of ribs. The, uh, on the 12 pairs of ribs, we actually have three different types of ribs. The first seven are directly attached to the sternum. And because of that, they're known as true ribs. The next three pairs of ribs, you can actually feel if you slide your, your hand um, down around your tummy and move it up, you can feel your ribs there, but those ribs that you're feeling there, kind of around your, just above your waist, are false ribs. So these ribs are not directly attached to the sternum, pairs 8, 9 and 10. They're attached through cartilage, which in turn is attached to the sternum. The sternum is also known as the breastbone and it's just here. And then we have ribs 11, 11 and 12. And as you can see there, they're not actually attached at the front at all. They're just attached at the lower two thoracic vertebrae. These are called floating. These are the ribs that sometimes you may hear of becoming impactus. They can become impactus in the lungs most commonly. Um, apparently the pain is absolutely horrific. It's not generally serious and you just have to wait until the rib pops itself back out again. Just quickly a once over that. So we have 12 pairs of ribs and a sternum here is what is commonly considered, commonly called, the breastbone. But for anatomy and physiology, you may as well know the actual technical term. So the first seven pairs of ribs are known as true ribs because they're directly attached to the sternum. The next three pairs, eight, nine and ten, are not attached to the sternum at all, but they're indirectly attached through cartilage which is in its turn attached to the sternum. And then we have pairs 11 and 12, which are not attached at the front at all, are only attached at the thoracic vertebrae. These are called floating because they're obviously floating. Um, and these are the ribs that can become impacted in lungs and are probably quite painful. What we have on the next page of your manual is just an explanation of all that. I'm going to move on now and look at the different types of bones. So, bones are classified according to their shape. We have long bones. Long bones are mainly found on the outside of the body and they are mainly for movement. So bones on the arm, no, that's the hand, oops, okay. Bones on the arm, humerus, radius and ulna, same on the leg, they're clearly long bones. And also bones in the hands and feet. So not the carpals and not the tarsals in the wrists and ankles, but long bones in the hands and bones in the fingers and toes are also long bones. And you might look and say, 
well, long bone, my fingers don't look like, and that does not look like a long bone. But if a matchstick was a bone, it would be considered a long bone because it's more to do with the shape rather than the size. So a matchstick is longer, kind of up and down, than it is cross, and that's why it would be considered a long bone. And another bone that you might not consider a long bone would be the clavicle. It took me a long time to figure out that the clavicle, collarbone and scapula, shoulder blade are different types of bones. I don't know why, it just couldn't get into my head. But when you look at that, you can actually see quite clearly that the clavicle or collarbone is a long bone. Okay, so to look at the flat bones, flat bones are in the cranium and some in the face, protecting the brain. We also have the ribs and sternum, which protect the heart and lungs. And we have bones, the pelvic bones, our hip bones, protecting the organs of reproduction. So, not all the bones on the face are flat, so a couple of bones are flat, so... How I you would remember which bones are flat and which bones are irregular. I would visualise a helmet. And in my mind I have the Roman soldier's helmet that used to come down over the head and cover the nose and around the eyes. So the bones on the cranium that are flat would be the occipital skull bone, the parietal, which the bone at the top of the head, well two bones at the top of the head, which are fused, and the frontal bone, which is the forehead. Also, bones on the face that are flat would be the nasal bone, the lacrimal bone, little one here that houses the uh, tear duct and the vomer. So visualise the helmet coming up over here, down around there and kind of covering around the eyes as well. The next lot of flat bones, as just mentioned, are the ribs and sternum and these bones are flat, protecting the heart and lungs. And then finally we have the pelvic bones, the ilium, ischium and pubis, which are protecting the bones on the, um, the reproductive, sorry, the bones are protecting the reproductive organs. Next up is short bones, or next up are short bones. And short bones, I mentioned earlier, that the carpals in the wrist and parcels in the ankles are classified differently to the rest of the bones in the hands and the feet. So carpals and parcels are known as short bones and their main function is stability. And now we're going to look at sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones are bones which aren't directly attached to other bones. So we have the patella or kneecap, which floats, it kind of moves as you move your, your leg. Um, it's not attached to either the upper bone or the lower bones. If it was, it would be, it would be a problem. Um, we also have the hyoid bone, which you mentioned earlier. Hyoid bone located at the root of the neck and obviously not attached to any other bone. So to finish up then, the last type of bone we look at are the irregular bones. Irregular bones are found among the vertebrae. So the vertebrae not only don't resemble any other bones, they also don't even resemble each other. Uh, bones on the face are mainly irregular. We have a couple of exceptions, which was the nasal bone and the lacrimal bone, which are flat, as in the Roman soldier's hands. The rest of the bones on the face are classified as irregular and I mean they look irregular, so I mean the mandible 
shape is that? Is it an L? Uh, no, I don't know. Um, maxilla. The etmoid, etmoid bone, which forms the eye socket. The zygomatic bone here, which is the uh, cheekbone. The bone forming the palate of the mouth, the palatine bone, is also a regular. And these two bones here, the sphenoid and the temporal, are bones on the cranium, which are irregular. We've covered a lot in this section. We've been through all the main bones on the body and the different types of bones. And what I would suggest that you do before you move on is that you try doing the questions for this section. Try doing the questions before you look over the video again and before you read the manual. You really find that when you get something wrong, it actually sticks in your head and it means that when you're going over it again, it kind of stands out as being, oh, that was what I forgot. So, uh, definitely worth doing that. And the next section we're going to do is the different joints on the body. And then we look at the various different diseases and disorders and why it's so important for you as a holistic therapist to understand all that. I hope you didn't find this um, too overwhelming. So do feel free to break it down and take it in bite-sized chunks. Thank you very much and I will see you in, I'll see you for the class on joints.